Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Monday, May 11th, 2020, and today we're going to be discussing the new Emerson College polling data in Ohio and Texas. We're not really going to go too much into California, but there is some data from that state. So Ohio and Texas probably have been one of the least polled states in the uh, entire electoral map. Iowa has received more polling data than Ohio. The last time we saw a poll from the state of Ohio was back in March of 2020. So I thought when I saw this poll, uh, it would be really interesting to cover just because there's just been a big lack of data, especially from Ohio. There has been a little bit more polling data done in Texas, given how uh, recently close it's been expected to get. But uh, in the overall uh, scheme of things, Ohio definitely has been underrepresented in terms of polling data. These states are crucial to both sides' victories back in 2016. Donald Trump was able to carry the uh, state of Ohio and Texas by a pretty substantial margin. Um, you know, uh, when you look at the states themselves, obviously, if they did become toss ups, it would effectively rewrite the electoral map. Right now, Ohio is a bit more of a toss up than Texas. Texas is competitive, but I wouldn't say that it's uh, capable for the Democrats carrying it. When I say competitive, it means that it's going to be close. But at the end of the day, I do think that Donald Trump will carry Texas. The same can't be said for Ohio. Ohio definitely has a possibility of going to Joe Biden, but it isn't exactly the uh, most likely scenario in this case. Um, but when you look at the electoral map, just taking those two states out of the uh, equation puts both candidates at, uh, I guess, the ability to lose or win. Um, you know, Donald Trump would not have won without Texas, and uh, the Democrats can't win without uh, the Rust Belt. And if they've lost the Rust Belt, they'll need Ohio and Texas. But I just think that the data from these states are uh, pretty interesting and telling signs of what we might see in uh, November. So let's start off with Ohio. Let's first talk about President Trump's uh, approval rating. So he has a 48% approval rating and a 45% disapproval rating. Keep in mind, in 2016, Donald Trump carried this state by around 9%. They said that they would vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden. When you add in undecided voters, meaning if they were forced to pick an option like they will uh, in November, uh, they said that they would vote for Trump. 51% of them said they would vote for Trump, and 49% of them said they would vote for Joe Biden. So obviously that's a lot narrower than what we've seen in previous elections, but it's still a victory for President Trump. At the end of the day, he's overall approved of in Ohio. It's not exactly super crucial to the Democratic Party in terms of victory, but at the uh, it's still somewhere that the Democratic Party should have a presence in. Um, definitely should lay out groundwork for the 2022 midterm election and... Uh, regardless of the outcome of the presidency, definitely should still have a presence in Ohio, though Ohio definitely has been trending red in the past couple of years. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say that the Democrats still could win some statewide races as they did in 2018. As for the presidential election, I expect Ohio to go to the GOP, but keep in mind, no president since I think um, a long time ago, I think before, or uh, Jimmy Carter, I don't think any president since then has lost the state of Ohio and won the presidency. So Ohio pretty much goes with the uh, presidential um, victor, which means that, you know, if we see Trump winning Ohio on election day, definitely is a telling sign in terms of history. But again, uh, Donald Trump, if anyone, has shown us that he could break uh, historical boundaries in terms of winning the presidency. Um, when you look over at the uh, state of Texas, this is 38 electoral votes, a bigger prize, but not so much um, in terms of importance. Uh, right now, President Trump leads uh, Joe Biden without undecided voters, 47% to 41%. But when you put in undecided voters, it narrows up to a 4% lead. So a 2% lead and a 4% lead in Ohio is by no means comfortable for Donald Trump. But when you take out those undecided voters, keep in mind a lot of them are either just not going to vote or may end up voting third party, Trump's leads do expand. In the state of Ohio, it's a 3% lead, and in Texas, a 6% lead, which pretty much puts Ohio um, in the same character as if there were undecided voters taken into account. But if you move over to Texas, these uh, this state would move over into the likely column uh, compared to if you just did it with the uh, undecided voters. And I think that it is really interesting that Joe Biden has... Um, He's within striking distance of both of these states. Previously, it was overhyped. I mean, Texas arguably was overhyped by the mainstream media as becoming a new toss-up state. Realistically, Texas isn't going to be super close. And as for the um, Democratic Party, they probably could get uh, a victory there in four to eight years on the presidential level. I'm not seeing it in 2020. I mean, Texas, if it was to go to Joe Biden, a lot of other states would have to go as well. Um, Joe Biden has been really focusing on these Rust Belt states, 
Uh, the VP nominee is something I also wanted to discuss because uh, if you look, let me see if, <coughs> sorry about that. Let me see if I can find it um, for the vice presidential nominee right here. 29% of Ohio Democratic voters say they want Biden to choose Elizabeth Warren as the VP nominee and 19% for Senator Harris. You know, it's really interesting to me that, uh, um, you know, Elizabeth Warren has been leading the pack in terms of who candidates want or who voters want to see as the eventual vice presidential nominee. When at the end of the day, Kamala Harris is definitely leading the top of the pack. And the California Senate seat is not at all competitive, but Massachusetts definitely could see one. If you look back at the special election back in 2009 um, or 2010, I remember Scott Brown won a victory there. And, you know, it was a big deal because it was Massachusetts. It shouldn't have gone to the Republican Party. It's the most Democratic state in the union. And, you know, Elizabeth Warren does pose a threat if she is the uh, VP nominee, if she gets appointed. Um, as v the VP nom, then she would have to relinquish her Senate seat upon victory in November. And, you know, Charlie Baker, I think there might be a law in Massachusetts, but um, Charlie Baker, if he has the option, would likely choose a Republican. And uh, that special election definitely wouldn't go well, regardless if there is an appointed Democrat or not. Um, I think a safer bet would be Senator Harris because she comes from the state of California. As for Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren, they all pose a threat to Biden's presidency because that one Senate seat seat could make or break the difference, especially with how the closeness of the Senate as of right now, it's supposed to be insanely close, possibly a 50 to 50 type tie in which the VP uh, breaks the tie. If you're talking about a special election immediately after Biden is elected, you definitely can bet that Republicans will come out full force and uh, vote out or vote for a Republican and put them in that Senate seat, which will obviously not be beneficial to Joe Biden um, and to the Democratic Party whatsoever. As for Texas Democratic voters, again, they like to see uh, Senator uh, Warren, sorry, um, yeah, Senator Warren, and then Senator Harris at 21%. So Stacey Abrams, though being a very public figure in terms of um, actively campaigning for this VP position, is lagging behind in terms of support from a number of these uh, states. Ohio is tied with Klobuchar and Abrams at 11%. In Texas, she only gets 10%. Um, you know, in California, Harris obviously is a favorite, but only narrowly, and she is from that state, so that's kind of unexpected. But uh, Elizabeth Warren at 24%, Klobuchar at 13%, and then um, Stacey Abrams isn't even on that list. So when you think about that, it definitely seems like Senator Harris is going to be the VP nominee. Um, when I first made my first ever Joe Biden versus Donald Trump election video, I had Senator Harris as his uh, VP nominee. So I honestly hope that comes true uh, just for that sake. But uh, again, the California Senate seat is not at all competitive and will not be whatsoever. As for the uh, important issues that are uh, these issues that the voters care about. The economy is definitely number one. That's a go-to for a number of Republicans, but also some of the Democrats. Beating Trump seems like a Democrat-only issue, so 25 22%, 30%. Um, Health care is a top issue. Re-electing Trump, immigration, and then it's pretty much spread out. Immigration isn't as big of an issue as it was in 2016. A lot of that is because um, it was a big issue when Obama was in office for a lot of the Republican voters, but a lot of them don't necessarily care about it as much considering that Donald Trump is president. Um, but when you take a look at these states, these were never supposed to be states that Joe Biden was supposed to win. Obviously, California was, but for Ohio and Texas, these realistically were going to go to Donald Trump again. Now, it will be very interesting if Joe Biden does actively campaign in Texas and try to make it super competitive, but realistically, I don't think he will. As for Ohio, I don't think he's going to be super focused on it, but it is just a plane ride down from Michigan, a car away, a car drive away from Detroit. So, um, you know, uh, when you think about it, it is possible that Biden does contest Ohio, given the uh, general public as the around the same voting block as the Rust Belt. But for Texas, though Biden is going to try to harp on uh, Arizona, I don't think that Texas is going to be a forefront part of the Biden campaign. And, uh, you know, this, the last time um, well, when McCain gave up the state of Michigan in 2028, uh, or that sounds so weird, 2008, uh, Michigan went to Obama by around 17 percent. OK, so really shouldn't be giving up states, but um, if we're talking about the funds that need to go to uh, either um, Joe Biden's campaign in Michigan or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, they're definitely going to give up some of these Texas ground offices um, and focus all of their attention to the Rust Belt because realistically, based on the 2016 map, it doesn't matter if Trump wins Ohio and uh, Texas, as long as Biden gets the Rust Belt, he wins the election.
That's it. That's all he needs to do. Now, the reason why um, there aren't as many delegates for uh, Joe Biden is just because um, the states that uh, voted for him, uh, I'll just fix it, had faithless electors or voted for Clinton had faithless electors. But um, in this scenario, again, the Rust Belt is going to be the biggest portion of the 2020 election. You will see countless virtual events or, um, you know, possibly even drive in events for while well, we're talking about the Trump campaign um, in Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. This is probably going to be the only area that the uh, Democrats need to focus on. They're not going to lose Nevada, but if they lo do lose a state like New Hampshire, they still win the election by carrying the Rust Belt. Um, gives them a lot of leeway in terms of where they're uh, attacking Trump on. This is an area that uh, Donald Trump has definitely fallen out of favor in terms of approval. Um, so it should be really interesting to see what uh, type of campaign we see. But realistically, Texas isn't going to be focused on the fact that I Ohio is pretty close is good news in a sense for Biden's campaign. But at the end of the day, it's a winner take all system. And if Trump's winning there, He's winning there. doesn't matter the margins. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you all tomorrow.